Good afternoon, everyone. It's Coach Wildman from Volleyball Coaches of Canada. This is Volleyball um, Coach the Coaches Session 23 with the University of Utah Head Coach, Coach Lanier, and co-host Peter from Fort McMurray and Team Alberta Coach uh, for the summer of 2021. Uh, coaches, thanks for joining us. Yeah, nice to be here. So, Coach, um, you know, you're not only a coach, you're obviously, uh, a, are we a New York bestseller yet? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, but no, I, I, I've been kind of going through the book and uh, over, over this COVID uh, year, and uh, it's a really interesting book how you uh, connect sport and, and life and sport and business. And there's so many things, I, I mean, I recommend it to any coaches that, are, uh, that have a library of volleyball books, um, but there's so much more to it than just volleyball. So can you take us through kind of what got you on this sort of author train and uh, tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, so the, the book's called Stop Competing and Start Winning, The Business of Coaching. Um, I, always, I always tell people, I don't get asked from young coaches how to teach blocking or how to teach passing. I always get asked, how do you deal with your staff? How do you deal with this situation? How do you, you know, handle the organization of your, of your program? How do you delegate? How do you figure out who's doing what? And all these kind of things. And so that was always, I was always very, it was always, I was always glad to help younger coaches because I actually did have some quite a few systems in place. I've been here for a long time. But when we went to the Pac-12 um, 11 years ago, we, we added a lot of staff and I hit the road recruiting a ton. And about four, and we were doing okay. You know, we finished ninth and seventh. And, um, but about, about year four or five, I asked a friend of the program, a world-renowned Training and strategy uh, consultant named Leo Hoff, who is my my co-author, to and so you know he was a friend of the program and to just take a look at my program, the inside of it, and talk to me about what can we do better to try to figure out how to win. You know, we we're in the pack, and you know I didn't I didn't want to just go to the Pac-12 and just you know compete and be in the lower half. I wanted to get in the upper half, and as it turned out, we've you know, finished third the last two years in the Pac-12. So he really just kind of took it to another level of how to organize my organization called Utah Volleyball. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you start adding up all, you know, all the people that we work with, whether, you know, you have, let's say 15, 12, 15 players, you've got your assistant coaches, I have a director of ops, I have a strength coach, I have a trainer, I have a nutritionist, I have sports scientists, I have SID, I have, you know, and it goes on and on. And so he really started just showing me a bunch of kind of business tools, ideas, concepts. We started talking about this idea of delegation. And, and he actually said, you know, when I asked him, he said, Beth, you gotta learn the number one rule of, of successful business people. And I said, oh yeah, what's that? And he said, it's, he said, anything that can be delegated must be delegated. Hmm. And I said, yeah, okay. And he goes, no, don't think you get it yet. And so that's, that started us on a journey, went up to lunch, and after that I went back to him and I said, keep talking to me. And so we had started doing some presentations at the ABCA convention, and at the start of COVID, you know, his, his consultant's uh, business wasn't, you know, flowing as, as much as it does, so, you know, he said, hey, you want to write a book? And I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and he said, come on, give, it, give me three weeks, and uh, we never looked back. It was, it was a great experience. So, you know, you guys have been such a successful team and now that you have, I know, I know you have a graph in your book regarding all the different positions that you, you have to deal with and, and the pyramid and, and whatnot. Um, was it most, most coaches are control freaks. I mean, stereotypically, right? Like, so, you know, you kind of want it your way or it's the highway and not you specifically, but coaches in general, like how did you manage to go through a process where to, it was okay to let go and it was okay to trust others. Yeah, delegation, it's, it's a double-edged double sword. It's absolutely critical to success and it's really hard to do. It's really hard to give up, you know, what you've done. And, you know, I, 
I coached, I started this program 31 years ago. I did everything, right? Right. And it is hard to let go. Um, but there's so much more than just letting go of control. You know, it's, it's giving responsibility to people that can carry out your expectations of, of the job or task or project. You know, you help them, you guide them, you mentor them, you give them, you know, guidelines, and then you create a communication system, um, you know, to report back, to check in. And so it truly isn't just giving up control, because I, I can't give up control of my program or anything, because ultimately I'm responsible for it. Um, but, you know, tasks and projects that maybe I don't have to be involved in, or probably task projects I'm usually involved in, um, maybe they're going to do it at 85% as well as I might do it. Well, then I can just go in and, and handle the 15% and, and not 100%. And then there's this idea, you know, this concept of repeat, repeatability, which we know is so important in the sport of volleyball. It's the same thing. I, you know, if I don't delegate because I think I can do it better and faster, which I can, um, I'm never teaching someone. And once they figure it out, they can do it 20, 30, 40 times, and I don't have to worry about it again. So. Um, I agree. I think that's the number one thing I hear from coaches is, man, it's hard to give up control. And I get it. I, it it's hard. You know, even on the volleyball court, like, you know, how I want it to, you know, if I could work with every position all the time, you know, it'd be awesome. But I don't have time. So, I mean, obviously, the, you know, going to the university level, NCAA Div 1, if someone, you know, if things go wrong, it's your head on the line, you know, 99% of the time, right? And so have you ever had to over, not overstep, but step in um, based on you gave delegation, but it didn't quite go the way you were hoping and things are a little bit spiraling out of control and you got to jump in. And how do you, how do you deal with your staff on that sort of thing? Because I think a lot of coaches just don't know how to deal with staff in general. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's why they need to read my book. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of tools that are available to create systems and get systems in place to handle that. And absolutely, absolutely, I have to step in and um, sometimes have some hard conversations. Sometimes just give give maybe my assistant more information on on what you know they might need more information and more direction on what you know, my vision of something is. Um, so the goal is to not let it spiral too far. If, if things spiral too far, we're in trouble. But absolutely, there's constant navigation and, you know, readjusting and, and figuring out, you know, just, yeah, keeping, keeping the wheels moving all in the same direction. Um, man, I, you know, I, I, I talked about this a lot. Uh, I talked about this in my book, and it's so profound to me. You know, the great late Carl McGowan, uh, was the men's volleyball coach at BYU and um, national, you know, coaching many Olympics for USA and of course you know his family really well from Utah. Um, you know, he, he had a neighbor that that was a rocket scientist, mm -hmm. literally. And he watched Carl and all he did and he said to him, he said, I, I think your job is more difficult than mine. Because when you start dealing with so many people and so many variables, and our jobs, you know, I don't whether you're at Division One or high school, mm -hmm. honestly, or club, you know, no day is ever the same, and it's it's complicated, and you're dealing with so many different things. Um, my director of operations, just him and I, just had this conversation. He goes, I've never experienced anything like this. He goes, every single day, I've got you know, ten different things going on. I say, yep, that's. That's coaching. So, <laughs> yeah. So, it's just a matter of getting systems in place and communicating and keeping things going. I got a question here from uh, a gentleman named Jared Mathis. He's a high level uh, uh, referee in uh, the Alberta system. Uh, what constraints slash objectives does uh, do your AD slash school put on you and your program, and how does that affect your approach to running your program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I, I'm not different than anybody else. I'm pretty sure every athletic director's number one objective is to win. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, win at the highest level possible. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot that goes into that, right? Like, you know, what are the resources being provided? Um, if they're not being provided, how do I get creative? 
with figuring out what I got to do to meet those objectives. So I don't want to say it's just winning, but it certainly drives everything. I mean, they, they want our they want our team to be, you know, good citizens. They they want us to do well academically. They want us to be involved in the community. We have so many things that are available to our student athletes to get involved with. Probably more now than ever with you know social you know programs and and different things and um so yeah i think there's an expectation that we're involved in the community we do well academically we represent ourselves we represent our program and the university and the athletic department well and then we win and so you know my old athletic director used to always tell all the coaches he says i can't put more pressure on you guys than you put on yourselves and I, I think that's true as coaches. I think, you know, we we are driven to win and to, you know, teach lifelong lessons to young people and uh, create a good environment for those people, you know, for these kids. And so I think, you know, whether it's given to us from an, an athletic director or it's just inherently, you know, how we see things as coaches, um, you know, we just got, we do have, we do have objectives and, and, and goals. and. For me personally, I, I have three things that kind of define my program and that took me a long time to figure out and I base all my decisions and, and goals on these three things. And one is to win at the highest level possible, whatever that, whatever that is, at your level, at my level, what year, what my, what my talent level is, um, you know, the combo of my team, um, to uh, teach lifelong, number two is just to teach lifelong lessons and to teach my players to become lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. And so we talk a lot about that. And then the third thing is to have a team that loves, trusts, and respects each other. And that one's the, the toughest part probably. And <laughs> we spend a lot of time working on that kind of stuff because, you know, we have goals to have a good experience and, and win and, you know, learn and it takes a lot of work. Fair. Um, so the book itself, what made you come up with this name? What's the difference between competing and winning in your eyes? Yeah, I think I think you can. Comp I think people compete really hard um, and work really hard, but sometimes they're they they spin their wheels. You know, they don't have clear objectives of and and systems in place. And when you you know you you can create a program that's designed to win, and that's kind of what the book's about is creating a program that's designed to win, not just competing, not just working hard. I think everybody works hard. Right. Um, but who's the most efficient and who's figuring it out to move the dial, you know, faster than somebody else. Peter, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah. Thank you. So coach, you've been very successful over your 30 plus years. How have you seen the game uh, and the players evolve during that time? Like, and do you see it further evolving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are two kind of different um, things, right? The game, um, I, I, there's a lot of involvement, I think, on how we're teaching the game. Um, you know, I think back in the day, you know, we, we taught our skills and, and, you know, they came to practice and, you know, talked a little bit about some life, life lessons things and that, that was it. It's so much more comprehensive now. Um, and I would, in, I would include, you know, the addition of like sports science to how we teach now is becoming so much more critical in how we you know, not only teach, but how we monitor our athletes and how we train them, you know, both in the gym and, you know, strength and conditioning. And, um, you know, our players don't go very long without hearing from our nutritionists and, you know, they get, um, we do hydration testing with them, make sure that they're hydrated. So I, I think, I think the game is, you know, not necessarily the game of volleyball, but I think the whole structure of it at our level, for sure, is driven by so much more than just teaching volleyball. Um, and the players, you know, you know, I've always said I don't want to be that old coach that you know walks around the cane and says, you know, these damn players today, uh, but. So I think it's really, that's my go-to joke there. Um, I think it's really important to understand the players that you're coaching today. And, you know, I have been doing this a long time, but I do think that I've been able to 
to change with them and not get stuck in my ways. And if you do, you're you're going to be a you're going to be an unhappy coach, and you're not going to be around very long because they they demand that you understand them these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a good thing, and it's challenging because you know they're changing at warp speed. It feels like to me now <laughs> when I'm older. But yeah, I think changing changing with them and understanding them, I think, is really a key. And, and they they've changed a lot. You know, they want to know a lot more about why. They want to understand it. Um, they want to be part of the process more. They don't want to just be told what. Um, and so, yeah, how I do things now with my players is just completely different than I did, you know, 30 years ago for sure. Did I answer your question? I think you're muted, Peter. I actually muted myself. There we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, what about uh, you hear a lot of talk in the bubble world about making changes to the rules of the game, and it has changed over time. Um, but now you hear stuff about potentially not allowing back row attackers to come flying over the back row line. Uh, same with potential of the servers with the jump spin not coming into the core. What's your thoughts about the game changing in that respect? Yeah, I think that would be a disservice to the game if that happens. I think the game evolving is perfectly fine, in my opinion. I don't think we you know, have to be purists. Um, I don't know very many sp- sports that honestly haven't evolved. Um, you know, I, like, I personally think it would be a blast to give two points to the back row, for the back row kill, just like a three-point line in basketball. That's not on the horizon, so don't anyone quote me on that. <laughs> It's certainly, you know, it, it comes and goes every once in a while, get talked about. But, yeah, I think, I don't think we want to hold back these athletes, you know, and, and, and I get it, you know, it's, it's hard to make a stop in our game anymore, you know. It's, it's you know, the women's game's getting really similar to the men's game that way. Mm-hmm. But the defense will find a way. The defense will, will morph and adjust and figure it out, you know. We added the, the Libro um, to help the defense. Um, as it turns out, I think it helped the offense probably more because they took on more passing responsibility and freed up some hitters. Um, but yeah, I think I think we keep adjusting it. I don't think we should hold back the athletes because there's just tremendous athletes playing this game right now across across the world. It's it's uh, mind boggling what's happening um, at every level. I go to you know we just got on the road for the first time in 14 months, um, June June 4th, and. It was unbelievable to see these players that probably because we hadn't seen them for two years, but man, they were just big and athletic and physical, and it was pretty. It was pretty cool to see them play the game at such a high level. Was that a club level, or was that something else that you were doing? Yeah, club. A club. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, last you know we watched like they were eighth graders, and now they're going into their junior year. Right. You know, so it's it, quite a bit of development goes on during that time for sure. So it was. It was pretty. Uh, it was cool. It was, it was cool to see that they still did develop during COVID somehow, right. somehow. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I do want to go back to one of the things you mentioned before. I should probably should have asked you first. You talked about one of the three things was to love and trust each other for your teammates. How do you do that as a coach, and how can how can we co- like us coaches do this with our teams? Like, what sort of things did you do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. You know, and respect, you know, that that's such a big part of it. Um, listen, I think you have to work at this a lot. Um, by far the most important thing is, is, have, is creating communication systems for them to connect. And I don't use, you know, even more than communication and connection, I, I talk about engagement. You know, how do we get them engaging with each other, obviously, and, and you know, I, I've learned now to ask if someone says, yeah, I talked to someone, I say, did you talk to them in person? And they go, well, no, I texted them, you know, and I'm like, that's not talking. And so, you know, I quickly learned that I needed to create systems and, and ways for them to engage. So, um, you know, we do, you know, we have... We have different um, we have different groups that meet. Um, we have um, we have like a little thing where 
they take someone out to lunch and they, they write down five questions before they go to lunch and then whoever they get assigned, they ask that, you know, they share and ask the, those questions of each other. And I think the whole goal is for them to just really get to know each other, just, you know, force, force them to talk and not just socially, you know, my players are really pretty good friends for the most part. They're, they hang out a lot. And if you ask any of them, you know, they're best friends. Um, but you put them in a competitive environment where they, there might be some tension or conflict. Mm -hmm. Boy, they are not willing to talk. And what we talk to them about is you have to be willing to test that relationship to, see, to make it stronger. If you, if you mm -hmm. won't talk to somebody that you consider a best friend about something that makes you uncomfortable, that relationship is never going to get stronger. And so encouraging them to have some, you know, sometimes hard conversations or real conversations and get past, you know, the surface and really get to know each other um, through whatever activities, you know, you come up with, I think is really key. And it's, it's, a, it's a constant thing that you have to attend to, in my opinion. Right. To yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah, I totally agree with that. And, and we're, we can go down a deep, dark rabbit hole on this one, but based on Again, we talked, we were with the University of Montana coaches last weekend and we, we dabbed into this. It's like with society and how it's changing and how maybe parents are maybe a little bit more helicopter parents than they were 10, 20 years ago. How do we, you know, how do we train kids at a club level to have hard conversations? Because by the time they get to your level, they better know it to an extent, you know, yeah. and not be, you know, uh, completely deer in headlights when it comes to that, right? Yeah, I think it's tough. I think it's tough at the club level because you can't not deal. You can't not have parents in the process, right? <laughs> right. I, I don't think you can. And yeah. I haven't coached it in a long time, but I don't think you could not have them involved. And so I think probably I would have them part of the conversation as much as possible, and it, to the point of them understanding that they need to step aside, right? Like, right. You know engagement with them I think I would think the more you push them away the more trouble they would have with that so probably some engagement so then you develop your relationship and trust with them and maybe then you they you know trust you more to take control of that situation you know take control of the team and maybe step away a little bit more but I, I'm not I'm not perfect when they ask about that and you know at the college level, I really, I, I talk to parents, you know, um, I have a open door, open phone line, um, but I don't ever talk to them and not the player. <laughs> and very, to be honest, very seldom do they call me. And if they do, I say, yep, yeah, I'll talk to your daughter about that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm talking directly with the daughter on, on all of those kind of things. Cause you know, and then they'll, they'll, they'll relay back, you know, and, and usually the parents happy and sometimes they just want me to know something. But yeah, I'm not going to just deal with the parents directly and, and not go to the player. Fair. Uh, just a fun question here, and I'm going to slide it in here just because Peter mentioned, you know, the development of the game and, and how it's uh, changing and whatnot. Is there something that we could change in the rules that would actually uh, amplify the game and take it into orbit, if you will? You know, uh, for example, like Ben Josephson from Trinity Western University men's team, you know, when he answered this question, he'd be like, best of seven sets to 15 or something like that, or sets to 12 or something like that. You know, and he goes, that'd be way more exciting. Is there is there anything kind of like off the beaten path that you would want to modify or change? Oh man, that would be wild if we did 15.7 games, because 15, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if the best team's going to win all the time, you know, if you do that, but it'd be fun and exciting for the fans, for sure. Um, I really, I really was kind of serious about the back row attack getting two points because there you go. Okay. think about the strategy that would come from that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a low, it's a high risk, some, sometimes low reward mm -hmm. set. And so your setter deciding when and, and where to try to get those points, you know, and just like basketball, like, you know, when they had the three-point line, mm -hmm. it was, you know, unusual for them to, to, you know, even, you know, take a shot from theirs, you know, back in the early days. And now that's all they do, you know. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It, it would be interesting if all of a sudden we were just swinging from the back row. And maybe that's 
maybe that solves our problem of you know not enough rallies, right? Because you're now encouraging you know the back row attack more. And honestly, the back row attacks are really interesting. Um, I've had two really strong six rotation outside hitters, two first team All Americans over the last seven eight years, and so we've really worked hard at developing our back row attack. And it's taken a lot of work to have it effective enough, even at our level, to to justify setting it. But we're finally getting there, and I, you know, the women's game is the, the back row attack is starting to become a, a fairly effective set. Where eight years ago, we, you know, my best all first team All Americans hitting, you know, under 100 out of the back row. It's like you can't justify that. But, you know, we weren't setting it at the right time. We weren't running it correctly, and and now we understand when to run it. And, you know, run it in system and not out of system. And, you know, we've got our hitters up over 200 now. So it's, yeah, that's what I would, that's, that's, I think that would be awesome. I love it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I know that, you know, I've, I've gone to the ACVA conventions and, and stuff like that in the final four. And I know a lot of, you know, some of the talks in some of these rooms are like, how do we make volleyball more interesting? And, and uh, in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago, it was like the semifinals were a really, they were awesome games to watch. And then the finals, it was like one, two, three, done. And we were like out of there in like an hour and 10 minutes, you know? And it's kind of like, how do we get more people engaged? How we get the TV rights? I mean, there's a whole bag of worms that come with this, right? So... But, you know, yeah. there was so much talk about that, you know, when rally scoring came into effect, I mean, you know, I mean, we were talking about timing volleyball, like sets, I don't remember what the amount of time was, but that was being proposed, hmm. you know, and so like, can you imagine like you're down a point and the server sprinting back to go get the servant mm -hmm. before, the, <laughs> before the time goes off. But that was, we were legitimately looking at hmm. those options. That's actually where the two point um, micro attack came in. Um, so, yeah, I mean. That is, that is a problem of our sport, I think, in that it can go an hour 15 or two and a half, 240. You know, that's a, it's a problem for TV. And, um, but you know, other than that, I think it's a great engaging sport. Sure. I, I'll tell you the other thing that I think would help our sport is to have more players playing on the way around. Hmm. Um, so you guys prob you guys play international rules in Canada? Le less subs? W yeah. Yes. We, yeah. It's not unli so, it's not unlimited. It's limited 12, 12 limited. Okay, so you're about the same as us, but you know, you go to the international the next level and it's you know, six subs um, one time in. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I, I'm I'm concerned about the junior volleyball level you know running too many subs in and out and not developing you know the all-around player obviously it hurts you know and i know our national team's program is concerned about that as well because they need those all-around you know pin hitters but um yeah it's also i think for the game and for watching the game you know kathy DeBoer, the director of the abca we talk about this a lot like you know how do you develop stars when they're coming in and off the court? Hmm. You know, going on and you know and off the court all the time. So, middles go off, and kind of fans don't understand that, right? Like, they're like, Where, "Where's their best player?" Um, and they could maybe get past that for the middle blockers, but you know, when pins go off, I think that causes a lot of a lot of confusion. But you know, if you really want to kind of develop stars, and I think develop game, and I think play a better game. We need to, you know, I, I think it's important to see more, you know, six rotation players. And, you know, that's what we do a lot in our program. We let them play. That's why we have, you know, such a strong back row attack. So. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I found when I, we, I came down to a U.S. tournament, you know, and you got to do down refing as the coach. And, yeah. God, some of these teams, it's like a hockey bench. It's just like players going in, players going out. I can't even, you know, keep it bloody straight. It's It, it happens so quickly. And... It's a double-edged sword because I think, at, you know, for us at Limited, at U14, U13, U15, it's like, you know, if a kid misses a serve, gets subbed in, misses a serve, and then gets subbed out, they're done for the game. And you got to give them that opportunity to, like, try it again, try it again. You know what I mean? But, as it, you know, yeah, there's arguments on both sides of the fence on that one, right? So, 
Um, just a question. I yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, at the at the club level, right? Like, and and a question here from Penny Brennan. She's a U18 coach here in Alberta. Uh, you mentioned uh, winning at the highest level as one of your three uh, topics. What are some key things you look for in an athlete to achieve this? Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a tough question. You know, figuring out recruiting is. Uh, I'm not sure any of us have totally done it, but, you know, for me, I mean, we, we need a baseline athlete. You know, we need, we need a certain level of player that can play high enough above the net. You know, they've got a certain level of athleticism or a certain level of skill. Um, we kind of look at it as like a little bit of a scale, right? Like if they're incredibly athletic and touching, you know, 10, five, their skill level probably doesn't have to be quite as high, you know, if they're, if they're you know, 9-11, 10 foot, 10 one, um, you know, it's a pin even at our level, then their, you know, their skill level needs to be probably higher. They need to, you know, be one of those passing, you know, pin hitters. Um, and maybe you can take a, you know, just a stronger athlete and give them a smaller role. Um, so that's probably number one, but, you know, we do a lot of work with, um, the disc assessment um, kind of behavioral profile studies. I don't know if your listeners are familiar with that, but it but it basically it, it um, you, you you give people a test, and we can't give recruits tests, but we kind of understand like maybe what their behavior profile looks like, and so we actually want a lot of different. Um, kind of styles on our teams, like like D is a direct and dominant, and S is supportive, and I is an influencer, and C is a conscientious kind of rule follower type. And some are fast paced, some are you know kind of slower paced. Um, and so we actually look we actually look at you know what is their behavior, how are they you know what are they doing on the court that's affecting others around them. Um, we're always looking what we're doing off the court. You know, we, when we're at club tournaments, honestly, a lot of a lot of coaches until maybe you're getting closer to deciding between people, we don't know if people are winning and losing. Um, we're looking at skill set, mm. and then we're look, looking at the individual, and we're looking at what is their interaction with their teammates, what's their interaction with their coaches, and then then off the court, what's their interaction with their parents, what's their interaction with their teammates and their coaches, and so. You know, we're looking for people that can make people better around them. Um, you know, it's not just the best athlete. we got to put together the best team, and I think there's a lot that goes into that. Peter, I'll throw it over to you because I know you have a recruiting question. Yeah, she, she kind of answered part of it. It's uh, what you do for recruits, so I'm going to kind of continue from that. Like, what message would you have for, like, a young athlete who's still at that, like, 14, 15 level, um, hoping to play at the next level? What advice do you have for those uh, young athletes trying to make it to to your level. Yeah. Um, you know, with the new recruiting rules, like we're, we're not, I mean, we're evaluating them, but we're not talking to them until, you know, June 1st, uh, June 15th before their junior year. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is going to slow the recruiting process down in a really positive way, I think. Um, although we're evaluating them before that, of course. Um, but um, so the um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? <laughs> sorry. Um, ah, recruiting. Yeah, no problem. Just the uh, like what, what advice? A, where was I on it though? Because <laughs> <laughs> I had a good. I had a good. You're just saying how you can't you can't reach out to the athletes yet until a certain age now with the new rules. Oh yeah, no, I think this is really important for 14, 15 year olds. Um, honestly, my advice is to love the game and be present. I you know we can talk about what they need to do to start getting us to start watching them. But honestly, if they invest in their game right now, that's going to be the number one thing that's going to help them in the recruiting process down down the way. So. You know, getting the extra reps in, playing as much as possible. Um, you know, working. You know, with you know maybe a trainer. Or, you know, whatever it is to physically keep improving, and just play the game as much as possible. And then when they get to, you know, they get to 
they're going to be seen if they're good enough. And so, but yeah, they, you know, they can write to coaches and, um, we're getting an enormous amount of emails right now, so it's getting a little <laughs> bit challenging. So they got to find a way to really catch our attention. But honestly, being just the best player that they can be is the best thing that's going to help them, you know, become, get recruited at the end of the day. Right. Now, for like a, a rural club or smaller clubs, do players that play for those clubs, uh, is there a, really any difference? Is it still a matter of just being the best? and hoping to impress the coaches. Mm -hmm. So if they play for a smaller club, is that right? right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I mean, I've certainly recruited out of smaller clubs. If they're if they're a good enough athlete and their skill level is, they're gonna find them. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is it does matter at the end of the day, at some level, that they play against really good competition. Absolutely. Yeah. And the more that they're going to play at that level, the more they're going to be pre prepared for our level. But listen, I love I love taking a, maybe a raw athlete and developing them, um, or maybe someone with a little less experience that's a really great athlete. And so I, I, I've actually recruited a number of kids out of smaller clubs over time. Yeah. So so how do you deal with this on a on a U.S. basis? Your influx of athletes is enormous compared to what we bring to the table in Canada. And you know, you talked talk about in your book about delegation and stuff like that. So do you have a specific person within your staff that just deals with recruitment and then gives you the short list, if you will, of mm -hmm. the 400 emails that you get a day, you know, regarding yeah. that or how does it work? Yeah, recruiting is such a beast. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, in my book, I talk about tasks and projects mm -hmm. and like tasks are things I'm going to delegate, and and they just need to they just need to do them. Let me know they're done, and I don't want to hear anything about it. <laughs> Recruiting is a massive project, it's the right. biggest project we have, and what that means is that there's got to be a lot of interaction, and there's a lot of tentacles that go into, you know, trying to whittle it down to, you know, ultimately who we offer and who we get. So um, we actually have different levels of responsibilities and recruiting. So we have somebody um, that does just baseline, t you know, looking at emails, looking at their resume and watching video, mm -hmm. um, you know, gives, puts them into, you know, a group. Um, then probably my second assistant is taking that and, you know, my recruiting coordinator then is taking that. And one thing that we did during COVID, probably more than we had been doing, we really watched a lot more video. And we actually did some rankings of players from video, which we soon found out it definitely is not the best way to, you know, when we get on the road and saw these players, you know, video sometimes shows them better than they are. Right. But that's okay. It's a nice baseline for us. So yeah, we just have this whole system of ranking them and getting them to groups and, you know, where, you know, where are we going to see them? What emails are they going to get? Um, ultimately, you know, how many players are we going to call when we can call them? You know, which coach on our staff is calling who each week? We, you know, we have, you know, we have a recruiting meeting every single week, and it's usually an hour to two hours. And you know, what is each staff member's responsibility? And it's all just to try to move the dial and you know whittle it from this big you know, group down and yeah, it's just this massive thing. And um, you talk about systems, like we have really good systems because we would get bogged, we'd get, you know, bogged down so easily if we didn't with recruiting. So like what the one of the one of the coaches here in Canada, Ryan Hofer from Trinity Western on the women's side, you know, he'll have a player come in to uh, and meet the team, have a day on campus, that sort of thing. And I know there's NCAA rules that, you know, there's probably a binder this big, you know, of rules that you got to deal with on that side of things. Yep. Um, you know, these, these athletes are the best of the best on their club teams. And then they come and now they're a first year playing against fourth years or fifth years or whatever. And now they're not the best. So now do you have an opportunity to give them time with the team to see if they, they click, they interact well, or is it uh, uh, based on the NCAA rules? Is it a bit different that way? No, actually, the new recruiting rules are actually going to really help with this. Um, they didn't used to be able to take official visits until their senior year, and now they can take them in their junior year, starting August 1st. 
and we can't so we can't we talk to them june 15th we can offer them a visit they can take five visits to whatever schools of their choice um i think a lot of them will take them during the fall of their junior year um it offers and i think this process is going to be condensed a little bit more back from you know back in the day we were offering ninth and tenth graders and then sometimes it was drawn out for two years um so what's nice about it now is we can bring players on and by the time they actually come on a, a visit with player or on campus we want them spending all the time with the players mm -hmm. we're not doing too much sales sales job by that point we want them you know if they've got the information nowadays they can get so much on you know off the web yeah. and, you know social media yeah. um so we're not doing a ton of that maybe a little bit more about the inner workings of our program but mostly we just want them to spend time with with players and the coaches and see if it's the right fit if it feels right um and yeah it's a it's an interesting process and sometimes you really know it's a good fit and sometimes from those visits you go maybe it wasn't the right maybe it wasn't a great fit you know so they're they're important it's important for players uh, recruits to come spend time on campus with the with the coaches and the players peter we'll dive into the game now Go, yeah, go ahead. I, just, I had a question from one of my athletes actually. Oh. Um, uh, basically, how often would you see like an NAIA athlete make that jump to Div One? Because you know we have a lot of our athletes who, you know, maybe aren't Div One ready, want to start at a lower level. How often do you see those athletes make a jump? Good question. Yeah, really great question. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't know. I don't see any. I, I, I'm not saying that they can't. I just don't see that very often. I, I you definitely see junior college, right? A two-year college to a four-year college. Um, okay. But you know, I, I, I don't see why they can't. And I, I think that developmentally is not a bad thing, right? What's happening sometimes, kind of with the transfer portal now, especially like. You know, people are getting developed, and then they become more interesting to you know maybe a, a better program, or, or they want a better program, and yeah, it's a convoluted situation. But um, I, yeah, if they can. Yeah, I don't see why they can if they're ready to go and they're good enough. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Dave, we're gonna kind of keep going here. Yeah, so go. Yeah. The uh, the change of tournament is super exciting. Uh, also very stressful. Do or die games. How do you prep your players and your coaching staff for such a big game? You know, uh, it was a couple of years ago you pushed Stanford to five sets, like the only team to do that in the entire tournament. Like, how do you prep your players for that, you know, do or die game, you know, against these other massive clubs like yourself or programs? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I just got asked this by a recruit. And um, <laughs> what's funny about that year, the week leading into the Stanford match, um, we had been at BYU for the first and second round and we won and um, and I heard some of my players talking about how they all need they, how they needed pedicures and so I said well let's get pedicures so I found a donor and we got it cleared through compliance and they all got pedicures that week so that so um, you know that's kind of a silly little thing but honestly it was it was a pretty cool thing that we were able to do and the players were ecstatic and loved it but more importantly um, I really believe that it's a combination of the season to be prepped for one of those matches. Um, in 2019, we had done as good a job of any year that I've ever coached with spending time with the, the team and with the leaders and really developing our goals, goals, you know, system, um, what what it was going to look like, what was important, how how we were going to try to, you know, in 2019. The only thing we talked about was we wanted to do something that the program's never done before. That was our goal. And us, that meant, you know, getting to the Elite Eight. We've, we've, you know, we've been really close a few times. Um, so we didn't talk, you don't talk about goals too much, but we had all these things in place to help us constantly remind us that we're trying to do, you know, do something the program's never done before. Um, including like symbolism. You know, symbolism's really strong when you're trying to, you know, get a team bought into something. And um, so we had just done a ton, we did a ton of work and, you know, this is the goal to do every year. The players were bought in, the leaders understood. 
when we there was tension and conflict, we were able to revert back to our conversations about what our goals were really mm. easily. Um, and so, yeah, I think you know it's it's definitely a combination of good goal setting and and understanding and buy in from the team for you know well before the championship comes for sure. Fantastic. Yeah. I got a quick question on on a typical practice that's a, a group practice, if you will. Um, is it mainly gameplay? Uh, like, do you have? Is it depend on the type of season and your micro cycle and all that sort of stuff where you're at? But you know, um, is it like if you had to put a percentage on it? A stereotypical group practice. How like how many drills would you do in a normal practice, and how much of it would be actually game oriented? Yeah. Um, every day, I would say, for most of the most of the time, for sure, during the season, we play anywhere from thirty to sixty minutes of full sixes drills um, of a two two and a half hour practice. Um, we definitely spend, you know, we spend twenty to thirty minutes every single day on serving and passing and setting. Um, that doesn't ever get missed and. Uh, then we do, you know, skill work and breakout work, um, offensive position work, um, small group work, uh, and then based on the theme of that individual work and small group work, that's going to go into the sixes drills. Um, you know, we're going to score based on whatever the goals of the practice work was. Um, and so, yeah, I think early on we play a lot more sixes. We, you know, we play a good hour um, earlier in the season. Once we're playing a lot of matches, um, that starts dropping down to about 30 minutes just because, you know, when players get tired, you know, towards the middle end of the season, players start getting tired. Part of their tiredness is their mental fatigue. A lot of it is their mental fatigue, even more than their physical fatigue. And when you're playing sixes, it can be fun, but you're also kind of having to deal with like, lots of other people and lots of other things versus just getting a chance to work on your own skills, which is kind of nice sometimes. So we start decreasing actually sixes a little bit as the season goes on and Interesting. Um, have a little less need for worrying about the team as much as just getting our skill work in, you know, getting ready for the weekend. So I know this is a kind of glass half empty, half full. Uh, there's studies that say that, you know, you're, you're, these athletes are going to be in their optimal uh training mode if you will at the start of practice so doing stuff that is gameplay at the start is, is is beneficial but then there's you know other people who go do you know small group stuff first and then see if it gets implemented into a game like situation at the end of practice what are your beliefs i've, tr I've done them both and i always go back to getting the skill work done and the small group work done and then taking those concepts and and kind of big rocks of the practice and getting them implemented into into the game so i you know i we do there's a point in the season where we're like we start you know we start we're starting every match slow let's start with sixes and we'll do it once in a while but right um yeah just and, and the other thing is just like honestly they need their i don't know at our level their bodies need to warm up and they need to get some really nice um, I used to go a lot harder at the start of practice, right. um, and we just don't, we, you know, yeah, you know, I guess I've learned a lot more through sports science and the value of, you know, just making sure that they're ready to go hard when we do go hard, and I'm not sure that's always, you know, right at the start of practice. Sure. Yeah. Peter? Well, I'm just going to step away from the gameplay thing, seeing that we're in a great uh, community of coaches, I'm just curious, what inspired you to coach? and? Uh, to go on this path? Yeah, yeah, great question. Hmm. I know when I was young, um, I was always talking to the coach. You know, I was always talking to the coach and we were always talking about maybe this player, what about this play? And I just, in fact, my coaches, you know, reminded me of that a lot, that I just was always interested in, you know, kind of the coach's perspective. Um, I actually got a a degree in business and economics hmm. and I actually you know I went to my first job fair um, after I graduated from college and you know and I, I really really do love you know a lot about that those fields but I went to my first job fair and I, I left that and I said I'm not working in the business world and my dad you know my dad was a small business owner and 
and I got it, but I just had a love for sport and it, it, you know, kind of moved my soul. You know, I, I don't know, I'd read the sports page and I'd get choked up, you know, like <laughs> there's something about sport that just really gets all of us, right? That's why we're in it. So right. I, yeah, I've been really fortunate. I've been, I've been, I've been able to get a lot of great coaching jobs and a lot of uh, great mentoring along the way. Do you have like one most memorable moment or not really? Um, coaching? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember a lot of, a lot of big wins. Um, you know, I, I remember the first time we beat BYU and that was a big deal because we were really bad when I first started and they were really good. Um, but more recently, I think, you know, we've been two out of three times the last three years to the Sweet 16 and lost in five, once to Texas and once to Stanford. So, you know, those stand out to me, like we're, we're right there and those are big moments, um, culmination of a lot of hard work. But, um, and then just one other, um, we had a tough year uh, my mother actually passed and we had some injuries and, and it was the toughest year ever and we went we went the mountain west conference we were in this big tournament we had the second strongest schedule in the country because we thought we were gonna have a really strong team we had a bunch of injuries all we had to do is win the mountain west conference we lost 15 15 12 in the fifth and we're in cause we're, you know and uh i've never i've never been so proud of a team like that 2017 will stand out to me um, because of the adversity that they had to face, and um, you know, when we get when we get together, you know, we're a pretty tight group because we went through a lot that year. So. That's cool. Fair. Yeah. Um, you know, on a coaching style uh, from yourself, like, do you have any keywords or keywords that you use with your athletes that? are basically just trigger mechanisms. You know, you can say one word, they know what the hell you're saying, and they know what it means, and, and they go with it. You know, that, you know, kind of earworms, if you will, uh, in in regards to um, how you coach. Yeah, I need to just have one word, right? That just, mm -hmm. it's like, if you train a dog, one word, just gets them to come. Yeah. Um, ah, that's, that's a tough one, Dave, that's yeah. a tough one. Um, you know, we, we talk about youth strong. We, we actually we we actually use youth strong. We're the only team on campus that uses that. We have it everywhere, and we define what that means all the time to like kind of each team. Like, you know, it's not just physically strong. Like, what does it mean to be youth strong? And so we we talk about that a lot. And it's kind of a a theme for our team always to come back to center on you know what it really means and what we're doing here. So. That's maybe one I can come up with. Yeah. On a on a in an in game situation, um, you know, you know, some some coaches believe, yeah, you just need a big left side and and they just get it done and and, and life goes on and, and you're great. Um, how do you work with middles to make them the the focal point of the game, right? To be to take the place of that big left side. Yeah. I'm actually, that's one thing I'm sad about in our game a little bit is that I think, you know, I think we're going away from the middle attacker uh, too much. Right. Um, you know, we've had, we've had actually a number of All-American middle blockers because we set them and I think they're really valuable and um, we pretty relentlessly are on our setters about running the middle um, more than what I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, kind of the style of the game is, you know, and I, under I understand, I mean, you have to have strong pins or you're not going to win. Sure. You're just, yeah. You have to, you know, you're out of system way more than you're in system. Um, you know, but if you're going to be, you know, a really full rounded team, you can't, you got to have good middle attackers as well. I mean, they, I don't think you could just have them be blockers and not set them to be really good. I think we got to set our medals and we got to have a diverse offense. And you know, we talk relentlessly about it. And we need our medals to buy into working hard to be up. If you know, if they're not going to get set, they're never going to get up. And then you're defeating. You know, then you're not holding the blockers as much. Like I, I think they're a really important part of the offense. And I, I think that we're losing that, and it makes me a little sad. And it's hard to even find good medals. You know, right now, like. Everybody's putting their best athletes on the pins. I get it, um, but it's an important position. I don't think we can go away from it. And if you know, you talk about the game changing, 
you know, I don't know, you know, offenses are getting really fast. So is the middle blocker going to maybe become a smaller, faster blocker because people aren't setting the middles as much and we just need to get to the pins? You know, I, I, I think there's something there that's on the horizon that might change in our game. Don't know what it is exactly yet, but yeah, that's a big, that's a big change in our game that's happening. Yeah, and I, I get parents that'll come up and you know their kids whatever six feet tall and they're like well they're too small to be a middle at at uh you know on the ncaa level so they, they're going to go left side now they need to play left side they need to play left side so i know there's a lot of club trends that are moving play middles from from middle to left side um regarding setting what are your sort of three key, key points that you focus on with setters um uh based on hand movement, eye, eye movement, and just, you know, decision-making on, on setting. Yeah. I mean, I think their hands need to be good and efficient and, and you know, but I, but I really think their, their footwork is, is something that we focus on probably as much as their hands, if not more. <laughs> um, you know, just being able to get to the ball efficiently and then having a skill set that allows you to get to the set, you know, a, a footwork, footwork skill set. Um, I want our players to get, you know, I want our setters to get to the ball and especially on the net, I want them jumping off of two feet and, you know, getting there early and, and giving the middle a place to, you know, get to and, and set away. Um, but when those balls are off the net, what's their footwork patterns that they're using? And, you know, I, I you know, we train a lot of, you know, off of one foot. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's about finishing and squaring and being as neutral as possible. I mean, we don't really talk about deception as much as just neutral body position. And, you know, if you, let's say you're just in system and you're taking the ball the same place every single time, that's that's the deception you need, you know? We don't have to get fancy. We don't have to, like, take it here and throw it back and do all these other things. We just have to be really neutral and really mm -hmm. efficient and have repeat, repeatability. And then the same thing when you're off the net, you know? Like, you've got the same thing. If you're going to spin, you got to take it the same way. You're going to set left front or you're going to set right, you know, right, right front. you got to take the ball really consistently. So... Those are the kind of the things that I focus on the most. Um, we certainly work with our stutters on understanding what the block is doing. Um, it's it's secondary to just putting up a really good hittable set. It doesn't have to be a per you know we tell our setters it doesn't have to be a perfect set. We tell our hitters it doesn't have to be a perfect set. Um, just a really nice hittable set is what we're we're looking for. And and then you know. A higher level skill is um, understanding, you know, what the block is doing, whether it's during the play or post play. I think there's a lot of information post rally that the setters can garner if they're engaged in, uh, you know, willing, <laughs> willing and engaged in understanding what's happening with the block. Um, a lot of information post rally. So those are kind of the key things, and then of course we do. You know, we do a lot of scouting, so we know what blocking tendencies are even before we go into a match. But yeah, I think just putting up a hittable set, working on good footwork, um, for sure handwork, and um, you know, just having a good neutral body position to to hold blocks as much as possible. Yeah, uh, you speak a lot about blocking. Now I know in the men's game, you you're, you see a, a lot more triple blocking than you would in the in the women's game. What are your beliefs on double and triple and is it more effective to have a double because that third player can be way more beneficial doing something else during during the moment you know yeah i had a period of time where i was working on uh you know max blocking we call it three you know three person um but honestly i i didn't feel like the benefits outweighed the mm -hmm. amount of time it was going to take to work on it and to get everybody comfortable and exactly right like somebody's got to be able to go hit mm -hmm. after we block, you know? And it's a lot easier to go hit from a you know, defensive position than blocking over, you know, on the other pin. So, yeah, we haven't done a lot of three-person. Um, you see it once in a while, but not very much. No. And div one is, that you, is, as you guys call it, div one. Div one. Yeah. NCA did one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it is. It has been uh, an amazing time being able to uh, pick your mind, mind on stuff. So, where do people find your book? 
It's on Amazon. They can, um, I'd say top, type in my name, but most people can't spell it. So <laughs> stop, stop competing and start winning the business of coaching. It's on, it's paperback, it's hard copy, it's um, on Kindle, and it's Audible. So we've got it in four, oh, okay. four ways that people can get it. And yeah, just order it off Amazon, it's, it's there. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate your time. Thanks for taking the hour with us. I wish you the best of luck in your off-season slash recruiting season based on uh, the rules and stuff like that. But no, I wish you guys, your team, the best of luck uh, next season. Hopefully it's a completely normal season at that yes. point. Uh, fingers crossed. And uh, yeah, we'll have this up on YouTube. I'll send you the link. Uh, Peter, any final thoughts? You're muted. <laughs> Man, rookie, rookie, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I just say it's a pleasure meeting you and speaking with you. Thanks so much, and thank you, Dave, for having me co-host as well. Right on. Yeah, no, this was great. I can't believe an hour went by already. It flew by. <laughs> I know. That's fun. That's good. Sounds good. Great questions. So. Awesome. Thanks, Coach, for being with us. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.